the word of God goes out with power. I pray, Lord, that you use me today, my mind and will, my emotion, that it be all of you and none of me. I pray that every mind be open to receive your word, every heart be open to receive the action, and, Father, that we hear the word and do it. And I give you praise, Lord God, that the word is in power today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles today to John chapter 4. Yeah. Hallelujah. John 4. John 4. John 4. We're going to be discussing the story of the woman at the well. Some of you may know this story, but we're going to be talking about the woman at the well. And Jesus is there, and here's this Samaritan woman. And we're going to go through much of the whole story today, and almost at the end of the conversation of the connection between Jesus and this woman, we're going to start reading at about verse 25. So this is John chapter 4 and verse 25. And the woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah is coming. I know that the Messiah is coming, which is called the Christ. And when he is come, he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Glory to God. And upon this came the disciples. Now, upon this what? Upon this conversation, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. He's sitting on the well and he sees the disciples coming and they see him. And upon this, upon this, the woman is talking to Jesus and the disciples come and they marveled that he talked to this woman. How interesting. Jesus is talking to this Samaritan woman. He's talking to this woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? And the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men. She didn't say to the women. She said unto the men. Come and see a man that told me everything that I've ever did. Is this the Christ? And they went out of the city and they came unto him. Now, if we're going to discuss this woman, most people would take this particular verse and they say, this woman is an evangelist. I'll tell you what, she was so inspired by the things of God. She has an evangelistic note and she runs into the city and she tells him, come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. Is this not the Christ? And evil people talk about the evangelism that's involved in this and people get stirred up to go bring people to Christ. But today, I'd like you to take you a little bit different place. Is that all right? I'm going to take you to John 4, 27. Look at number 27. Upon this, upon what? This Jesus talking with this woman. He's sitting on the well. Upon this came his disciples. They came upon him. They're like, they're, they were shocked. They came upon this and they marveled that he was talking with this woman. And yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou to her? Upon this, and today's message is this. <laughs> Don't be fooled by what you see. <laughs> Don't be fooled by what you see. Come on there, every one of you, and I have an opportunity where something's happened and it's just fooled you by what you're looking at. Yeah. Don't be fooled by what you see. Amen. John takes this entire chapter, this is entire chapter 4, and explains to us in the book of John about the rest stop of Jesus. He's going with the disciples. They're heading off into Jerusalem. But by the way, he says, we need to go by Samaria. So they're walking through and Jesus stops and says, I'm tired, I can't go any further. I'm going to have to rest here. You guys go on into the city and get us something to eat. So he sits down at the well and waits. Now while he's sitting there at this rest stop, he's down for the count, and the disciples have gone for lunch. But look at John 4, and we're going to start at verse 4. In verse 4, he says, I needs go through Samaria. I must needs go through Samaria. 
I must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. Now this city is near to a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well is there. Jacob's well is there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied, he was tired, he sat down from his journey. He sat down on the well. And it's about the sixth hour. It's about noon. Things were re measured in a different time frame than here. From the beginning of light was 6 a.m. and it was the sixth hour, so it was noon. It was 12 o'clock. It's not time for the women to go to the well. They go early in the morning while it's still cool so they can carry the pots. And all the women would be at the well when it's early. But it's 12 noon and nobody's there. Nobody's there. That's why this somewhat peculiar woman with a shady past shows up at noon. And so they're there, this woman of Samaria is there to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me to drink. And his disciples were gone away because he'd sent them to the city to buy meat. Now what do we know about this situation? It's a peculiarly odd situation. Because when they happen up on Jesus, coming back with the lunch... He sent 12 guys to go get. <laughs> Some of you would say, well, when we go out to lunch with our group, we stay there and eat. Uh-huh. He sent the 12 guys to go get lunch, and they all came back with the lunch. Now, how far is Jacob's well from the city? It's only half a mile to three-quarters of a mile depending on which way you walk. But even at three quarters of a mile, 12 guys can get there in 20 minutes. Have you ever walked in a group of more than 10 people? Someone goes pretty fast, and then you got one that drags along. <laughs> And so they're always turning around going, come on, Peter, come on. <laughs> and he finally catches up, and then they get going again, and pretty soon they slow down, because that's the way you walk with a group of 12. You don't stay together in a group of 12. Everybody hold hands and keep working. They just go, and then they stop, and then the rest of them catch up, and they're going for the entire three-quarters of a mile into town. They can do that in 20 minutes. Then they go to some kind of street vendor that's actually preparing food and they order 13 meals to go. <laughs> so he puts it together in what, 30 minutes or so? Any good street vendor can do that, right? So he puts 30 meals together, they package it all up. They didn't have any plastic bags at the time, so they're toting it in some kind of a leather-bound uh, uh, organized holder. And they're toting these meals back to Jesus. And it takes another 20 minutes or so to get it back. Maybe even 30 because now they're carrying stuff. Yeah. So they've been gone an hour and a half or more. Because they did everything by walking. There was no taxi, no Uber. Nobody picked them up. There was nobody with mass transit that told them, we can take you into town. No, they just walked into town, dirtied up their sandals, got the food. They get all the way back to where Jesus sent them away. And he's sitting on the well talking to a woman. A Samaritan woman of a shady background. And they come upon this and they said... We have the lunch, and he says, I'm not hungry. I have food you don't even know of. And besides that, I'm talking to this woman. And they're thinking to themselves, mm-hmm, I thought you was tired. <laughs> I thought you couldn't go on any further. You had to just sit down, because everybody else had to go into town to get food. You sent us all to go get food, and so here we're back with the food. Now you tell us you don't need it, you don't want it. You don't even want any food and you're no longer tired? What's going on? And I'm sure Jesus was thinking, don't be fooled by what you see. <laughs> now you can imagine that this situation, this situation, and he's sitting on the well. He's sitting on the well. Jesus said, I must needs go to Samaria 
And he tried to explain to the disciples, this was very important. It's a wayward motion of God. He only did what the Father told him to do. Father God wanted him to get into Samaria for some reason. He was following the pattern of God. Anybody have been there, ever been led somewhere and you wonder, I don't even know why I'm going there today. Because the Lord was leading him. He knew the Lord was leading him. And he went to Samaria. And there in Samaria was a hostile people. They were against the Jewish nation. You must understand, these people of Samaria had something against the Jews all the time. They resisted fellowship. There was racial and ethnic barriers that kept them from receiving the things of the Lord. In 2 Timothy 3, you get to verse 5, and it says it like this. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. These people of Samaria often tried to push themselves off just as the Jews. We're just like the Jews. No, you're not. We're just like the Jews. Uh-uh. We're just like the Jews. They have a little bit different in their philosophies, but we're just like the Jews. No, you're not. And the war raged on from the Samaritans and the Jews because they were considered unclean. They were unclean. They had no dealings with the Samaritan people. They had no relationship with the Samaritan people. They had no plan for the Samaritan people. They had no future to deal with the Samaritan people. They didn't want that. In fact, they had considered them exempt from a, relig a legitimate relationship with God himself. Because they said, how can these heathen people ever possibly be connected to God? They alienated them because of their past. They'd been in idolatry. They'd had multiple failures. They had dealt with all kinds of mistakes. But Jesus, he bypassed all that stuff that the Jews had built up against the Samarians. And he said, I must needs go to Samaria. Oh, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Those heathen people with their mixed culture were confused. I'm so glad it wasn't church people that was sent to Samaria. Because see, when church people see folks that are confused, they take an interesting uh, look at it, and they do it like this. When, when church people see folks that are confused, they have a tendency to do one of two things. They either alienate them or they attack them. And it makes no difference if they're former church people or people that don't go to their church. They'll alienate them or attack them based on what they see ethnically, what they see socially, what they see culturally. And those kinds of things have to be eliminated. And, but this is what was going on in this Jewish Sumerian culture. Not Jesus. He's going out of his way to get to Samaria. He's going out of his way pursuing the rejected people to bring him into the plan of God. I'm so excited what Jesus did. He found these Samarians so important that he was willing to add this to his agenda of his daily schedule. He was willing to sit on this well now, you've got to see this. How long did it take him to get to town and come back with food? According to most scholars, it was at least an hour and a half and maybe longer. And if you think about them being gone for an hour and a half, they happened to come up on Jesus talking to the widow woman or to this Samarian woman. How long had he been talking? Not long. So what did Jesus do for that hour and a half? He waited He just sat there and waited. He knew that the Lord told him to sit. This was your opportunity to deal with these Samaritan people. And she will be here shortly. Wait upon the Lord. Listen. <laughs> He's on the well at least an hour and a half to find help. In breaking down the cultural barrier for the Samaritan people. 
He's trying to help them get back into the plan of God. Now I would have thought, <laughs> as a good uh, historian, I would have thought that Jesus, this Jesus, the Son of God, he's the tribe of Judah, the seed of Abraham, this root of Jesse, he would have gone in and talked to the magistrate. And that would have set the people clear in all of Samaria. Yeah, no. You think he'd have talked to the legislature. Somehow he probably would have talked to somebody in authority. Maybe even gone to the king. If I was sending Jesus, I would have said, wait a minute, what are you doing here? This Jesus should have just gone and debated with one of their priests at the temple and showed what they had done wrong and where their heirs were and pointed it all out. Perhaps he should have made some kind of literature and given it to everyone and showed him specifically in the literature where they'd missed everything, made erroneous errors, written a book and told all about it and told people what they were doing wrong. But no, <laughs> Jesus tries a whole nother way. He sits on the well and waits. <laughs> He's not even waiting for a man, which is the culture at the time. He's waiting on a woman, a woman, a woman. This woman of Sychar, she comes out there, this one of questionable background. She shows up where Jesus is. And the interesting part is I think Jesus should have tried some other kind of public entrance to get there. But this woman of Sychar, this nameless woman of Sychar, shows up to Jesus to help break down the wall for the barrier of all Samaria. And she comes to the well where Jesus is. After Jesus sends the disciples away. And you might say, that is really odd that Jesus is there by himself. Au contraire. I think Jesus probably did this on purpose. Because <laughs> the disciples always seemed to find problem with anyone that needed his time. Don't you remember Luke 18? You get to verse 38. You see it in Luke 18 and verse 38. Jesus is there and he's trying to heal blind Bartimaeus. And blind Bartimaeus is crying out, Oh Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those that were with him, I was talking about the disciples, they said, shut up. <laughs> Keep it quiet. Can't you see the master's busy? And he yelled all the more, help me, oh Jesus, I'm blind, I can't see, I need help. This same Jesus also dealt with the woman of Cana. You see, when you get to Matthew chapter 15, to look at about verse 22, this woman of Cana showed up. And she came in, she was from that re region, and she cried out saying, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Oh boy, doesn't that sound familiar? Have mercy on me. My daughter is severely, severely demon-possessed. And he answered not a word, but the disciples showed up and said, Shut up. <laughs> Be quiet. Don't say anything more. Can't you see the master's busy? And she urged him all the more. And they said, send her away. She's make crying out after us, trying to get us to go do something. Jesus told the disciples, shut up. <laughs> I mean, you've got to see this as it really is. The disciples often made the wrong choice. They were still learning about ministry. The disciples show up at the well. They came upon the situation, Jesus talking to the woman. If they'd have been there earlier, they'd probably told her, shut up, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> but they didn't, see. They'd have been preoccupied with their ideologies and stopped the ministry of Jesus altogether. It would have messed up the mission of the Lord. These Samaritans, though they're theologically wrong, God had some kind of purpose for them. I think that we should quit looking at every other ideology as if it's completely abandoned from finding hope in God. God took them and looked at it and said, I'm going to change this thing. 
Jesus sat on the well at least an hour or an hour and a half and waited for this woman. Waited for this woman. The woman finally showed up. And he knew that, he knew it was her. I mean, how many, women, how many people come into the well at noon anyway? But the woman shows up and he's sitting on the well. And he starts the conversation. And the woman says, shut up. <laughs> she says, what's up with you? I can't believe you even talk to me, a Samaritan woman anyway. This is not normal. You're being a Jew talking to a Samaritan. This, doesn't go, this kind of stuff doesn't go on. Your people don't talk to my people. Cut it out. Why are you being nice to me? Why are you trying to talk to me? Look at John 4 and verse 9. And then the woman from Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now she's got an attitude. Anybody ever met someone with an attitude? I mean, they went to school, got a B.A., and then they got a bad attitude, so they got a double B.A. They got an attitude. This woman got an attitude. How come? Because she's been hurt so many times. The Jews and the Samaritans don't have anything to talk about, so she's recognizing this man is a Jew. He's not going to like me. He doesn't want to talk to me, and he's sitting on the well that I need to get water out of. I'm going to have to get in there. I have to get in there. Our two peoples don't have any dealings, she's thinking. People have, the hardest people to help are the people that have been hurt. Because if you try to help someone that Ben's hurt, they put up a barrier. They put up a, a blockade. They don't want to talk to you. They want to do anything but let you share any stuff with them. So she's got a big blockade up. Oh, by the way, I went to Boy Scouts. I went all the way through Got an Eagle. I got that life-saving merit badge. You know they throw you in the water on that situation? Come on. <laughs> You know they make you go save somebody in the water that's out there in the water that's drowning? Let me put it this way. You've never fought a fight like you're going to fight with somebody that you fight with that's drowning. It's like you think these people are in such problem they'd want your help. But they don't. They're such in desperation they'll even put your life in jeopardy. Because when you go to pull them out of the water, they'll fight like crazy. It's not easy to help someone that's been hurt or considers themselves a victim or been hurt at any time because they'll not let their barriers down. They're ready for a fight. And this woman's got an attitude. And even though your intentions are good, and even though Jesus' intentions were good, she's got an attitude. What's the deal? You trying to talk to me. And Jesus begins to deal with this woman, but she's very sarcastic. She's very sarcastic. But she goes from sarcastic, in a few sentences, she goes to sir. And then in a few more sentences, she goes from sir, because she gave him a little bit of respect, she went from sir to prophet. And then from prophet, she goes and says something like this. The Messiah is coming. I know that. And you sound like him. And Jesus said, I you speak with am he. <laughs> I am he. Ooh, glory. Now God is bringing this woman into a gradual revelation. Some of you need to understand, you've been brought into a gradual revelation. You started out in some other churches, and then you ended up in some spirit-filled church, and then you ended up in some teacher giving you some kind of knowledge where you're going, ooh, I'm getting something now. And you're saying, how's it happen? Because the Lord's been bringing you into a gradual revelation. And all of a sudden, you're going to see God in a whole different way you've ever seen him before. This revelation... Jesus was showing himself not as the enemy, not as an alien. He showed himself to the woman and she got so excited she called him sir and then she called him prophet and then she called him Messiah. Ooh, God will lead and guide you into the truth. His word is truth. 
He promised that. He said, I'm going to lead you there. It's not just one step at a time. He's preparing you to travel many steps at a time right now. He said, I'm going to give you multiple steps at a time. Revelation, even wisdom you've been praying for is going to come in massive groups. All of a sudden, you're going to know how to deal with your finances like you've never dealt with them before. You're going to know how to put stuff together. You don't even know where it's coming from. It's the revelation of the Lord. When I started out in the Word, I know I had a wrong attitude. <laughs> I wasn't looking for God at all. I had a wrong attitude and a wrong spirit, and I had a wrong idea of the aspects of faith. Had a wrong idea, but the Lord waited for me. He was patient. I went through all kinds of stuff to, w to get where I am. I didn't always think the way I think. I didn't always act the way I act. I didn't always have the relationship with God the way I have. But he took me through Revelation, the steps along the way to get where I am. He said, you're on an instant traveling fast pace revolution. It's going to get you to where you intend to be quickly. And it's going to come on you suddenly. Wow. The Lord didn't cut you out of his schedule either. He promised he's going to take you to where you are supposed to be. He said, I'll not, I'll not continue on without you. I'll change my schedule to receive you. He waited for me to get a progressive re revelation. I had to realize he was really the Christ. I had to realize he was really the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Oh, you get to Hebrews eleven six. it says it. It says, without faith it's impossible to please him. But those, he says, those that come to God must believe that, come on, must believe what? Must believe, he is. <laughs> He must believe he is. When I got a revelation of who he is, it changed me. It set me apart. It started to minister to me in ways that I can't even as describe to you. He began to show me who he is. He is everything that you need. He is everything that you want. He is Everything, everything, everything that you seek. Yes. Yes. He's been waiting for you. Yes. Yes. Amen. He's waiting for you. While you were a player. Don't shake your head yes now, come on. <laughs> while you were a player, while you were a drunk. While you were getting high. While you are being selfish. You waited. A time such as this, he's been waiting for you. He's been waiting. He sat by the well and he waited. Just like he's waiting for you. For some of you, he stopped the gun. I know he did for me. More than once I had a gun in my face. And the Lord stopped the gun. The Lord stopped the car wreck. I know We've been in bunches of them where the Lord just kicked the car out of the way and we weren't even in the wreck at all we got to spinning out the middle section come up on the other side we're like what just happened there the Lord saved us he saved us from diseases Come on, some of you have been saved from diseases. You've got family members all going through the disease, but the disease just skipped you. It's like, wait a minute, we stopped this generational curse. The Lord said, I've been taking care of you for a long time. I've been waiting on you. I've got a plan for you. And Jesus comes down to Jacob's well. He comes to Jacob's well. I love this. He comes to Jacob's well. He comes to Jacob's well. He shows up at Jacob's well. Anybody know anything about Jacob's well? It's dug out of solid rock. When Jacob dug the well, he went down 100 feet in solid rock to get to water. 
And this water is a natural spring that services that entire area. All of Samaria. All those people that are indigenous to that region. Oh, I love that word. He, all those people that are indigenous to that area, they all are serviced by Jacob's well. And Jacob's well. Jacob's well. Whoa. Jacob's well. What's another name for Jacob? Oh, yeah. Israel. Israel's well. Israel's well. Israel's well? They're taking water from Israel's well? Hmm. What this well is in the natural, Jesus is in the spirit. <laughs> now you've got to see this. Jesus said, I am the living water. When it flows out of me, when it comes out of me, you will be refreshed. So now, get this picture. You got a well sitting on a well. <laughs> He's the well of life. And he's sitting on this well of Jacob. Israel's well. You got a well on a well. He's sitting there and the woman shows up and she goes, mm-hmm. And Jesus said, give me something to drink. I'm thirsty. And she looks at him and she said, mm-hmm. You showed up at this well and you're sitting here. And the woman that's come to him, she's got empty buckets. This is very symbolic. She's got empty buckets. How do you show up to the Lord? Did you come with empty buckets? Are you ready to receive? She comes with empty buckets. She comes with empty buckets. She comes to the well. She comes to the well. She's traveled to this well many times. But this day, there's a man sitting Oh, let me put there. There's a well sitting on the well. And she shows up and sees this. And he starts a conversation with her and says something like this. Would you give me something to drink? He knows that her pots are empty when he starts this conversation. He knows that there's a lot of religious dogma in her situation. She's not supposed to even talk to Jews. And he knows that the disciples are not there at this time. Because they would not approve <laughs> of what he was doing to get into Samaria. In John 4 and verse 10, you got to see verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. You would not, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew, if you knew, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked me for water. If you could see this well upon the well, you'd ask me for water. Instead of going to that well, you'd go to this well. He said, if you could see, if you could see, and don't be fooled by what you see is what he's telling her. Don't you be fooled by what you see. If you could see, you would not be cross-examining me about that which is temporal when I'm about to give you something which is eternal. Right. Oh, glory. <laughs> and he says, give me something to drink. In John 4 verse 11, it goes on and says it like this. In John 4 verse 11. And the woman saith to him, Sir, appears to me <laughs> you got nothing to draw water from the well. You don't even have anything to get water from the well, and it's deep. Anybody remember how deep it is? 100 feet. He has nothing to draw water with, and she says, Sir, it seems to me you have nothing to draw from this well, and where are you going to get this living water? You can't even get into this well. Yeah, yeah. Sound like a pickup line to me. I'm sure that's what she's thinking, right? She's got a shady past anyway. And so she tells him, you can't even get water. What makes your water so special? 
and get down to verse 13. Down verse 13. And Jesus answered and said, Whoever drinks of this water, and he's pointing at the well. Whoever drinks of this water, he's pointing at that earthly well. He says whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again. They're going to get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of this well, come on now. He says whoever drinks of this well, he's pointing at himself. Whoever drinks of this well, I'm going to give him something where he will never thirst again. The water that I give him will become like a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He will never thirst again. And she looks over and says, mm -hmm. If I drink from your well, not that well, I won't thirst anymore. Okay, if I, if I drink from your well, not that well, I won't thirst anymore. Now she's in a dilemma. She's got a decision to make. Do I go with the earthly well where everybody else goes? Where everybody else gets water? Where everybody else gets filled up? Where everybody else gets satisfied? Or do I go to this new well? Because he also said he was the Messiah. I said it right to my face. I heard the man. He said it out loud. I, who you look for, am he? And she says, wait a minute. Everybody else gets water from that well. I'm sure Jesus said, don't be fooled by what you see. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be fooled by what you see. Just because everybody else gets water from this well does not mean you're going to be satisfied and get your thirst satisfied. Right. Now I got a word from the Lord. Hang on. Okay. The enemy has revealed to somebody in this room how you're supposed to make some money. Now hear me. It's It's not of God. Wow. That's a pretty heavy word. Be aware, be alert. This is a warning from God from the pulpit. The thing that the devil's trying looks good, although it has some acts, aspects that it will draw you away from church. It'll take away from the things of the Lord. It'll even take away from you being able to give certain amounts. Do not be fooled by the devil's actions. This is not of God. It'll not take you to the plan of God. It'll not take you to the promise of God. It'll not fulfill the very thing God says. It is only a substitute of what God has in store. Now hear me. When Jesus, no, 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 this is true, when God was preparing for Isaac, the first one born was Ishmael. If you know there's an Ishmael, the Isaac is not far away. It seems to me that every time just before the real, there's something false. That's happened to me many, many, many times. And I'm telling you by word of the Lord, just before the real is going to present itself, the false has shown up. Don't be moved by what you see. Hang on to that. Somebody's going to get blessed because and testify oh what the Lord did you see in, in Exodus Exodus 14 verse 13 the Lord said do not be afraid stand still and see the salvation of the Lord don't be moved Stand still and see this. He's coming through on your behalf. You don't have to figure out your second or third job at this point. Some of you need to go, oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Some of you need to see your finances coming in in the way that God said it's going. It's not going to be having to shift all kinds of things to make it work. So according to the scripture, it's, it's uh, 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 Psalms 27. In Psalms 27, some people are blessed by chariots, some blessed by horses. But he says, you got to trust in the name of the Lord God. Amen. It's a move of God that will re redeem you from this situation. Amen. Amen. It's not the plan of God. And if it's not the plan of God, it's not a blessing. 
It's a temporary fix, but it's not a blessing. It'll end up biting you. And the alternative, this devilish one, is not a plan of God. It's not a plan of God. Haggai, chapter 2. Haggai 2. Now Jesus is sitting on the well. There is a well, and a well on a well. But you've got to say no to this other well before you're going to get the plan of God. Are you with me? Yeah. In Haggai 2, verse 9, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. How many had a, a glory before? You had some glory, some good times with the Lord, had some glory. Oh, praise God, a lot of glory. He said, don't be fooled by what you see. The latter house will be greater than the former. Some of you had some income and you're like, oh, praise God, we got this big old income, it's good. You ain't seen nothing yet. I has not seen, ear has not heard. You can't even imagine what God's got planned for you. I had a dream the other night that somebody stepped in and bought us a church. I was seeing that thing being developed and when we got to go see a building that was done in such a way, we looked at a 10,000 square foot building completely done, I went, uh-huh. That just gave me hope in my heart. I went, praise God. Something is about to happen. Something's about to happen. Come on, we need to praise him. Glory to you, Lord. We just thank you. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. The greater, the greater has not happened yet. The latter will be greater than the former. Latter be greater than the former. Praise you, Lord. 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 And the woman said to Jesus, Give me this water. <laughs> Give me this water that I never have to thirst again. And number two, I never have to come down to this well one more time. I've been coming down here every day. I bring my pots that are empty. I fill them up. I walk all the way back to Sychar. I walk that three quarters of a mile. And I tote all these water pots all the way back because I can't come when everybody else comes. I have to come when it's hot, hot. I got to come when it's dusty. I got to come when the sun's shining. I carry all this water back. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to live the way I've lived anymore. I don't want to have the stuff I had anymore. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I want the plan of God in my life. I want to have what he said is mine. I'm tired of doing the same thing, getting the same results. Yeah. I'm old enough now, I'm wise enough now to know that I don't want to go through next year with the same way it was in the last few years. Yeah. I want God to work. I don't want the same old thing, this dead beat stuff over and over. I want to get on with this. Give me the water. Yeah. Give me the water so I'll not thirst anymore. Give me the water so I can settle down. So I can do the plan of God. Give me this water so I can step into my destiny. Give me this water. I'm ready to get this water. I'm not going to spend another year doing the same thing I did in previous years. I'm choosing a breakthrough. I choose the breakthrough. You're closer to a breakthrough in your life than you've ever been before. You're closer to the power than you've ever been before. You're closer to the peace of God than you've ever been before. You're closer to the glory of God than you've ever been before. He said, this is no time to stop. Press on, press on, press on. That's why the enemy's been fighting you so hard. Because your latter is going to be greater than your former. He's not done with you. What God has planned is tremendous. Don't be moved by what you see. You'll be fooled by what you see. Don't let that enter your thoughts. God is working on your behalf. He said, I'm going to take care of things. That's why the devil's working overtime to destroy you. He wants you sick. He wants you out of the way. He wants you tied up with some kind of anguish so that you won't fight anymore. You have an appointment with destiny. It's an appointment you did not set. It's been set by God. Wow. Wow. He said, I must needs go to Samaria. <laughs> it is an appointment set by God. You have an appointment. 
You'll not do the same thing over and over that you've done. But it's a plan. It's a setup of God. He says with this setup, everything is about to change. Some of you say, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> I can deal with that. Some of you have not considered anything but the same thing you got right now. And the Lord said, don't get too comfortable with that. Uh-uh. Don't be fooled by what you see. Don't get too comfortable with that. God is bringing you a breakthrough. God is bringing you, he's bringing you deliverance. God is bringing you, he's snatching you out of your situation and bringing you into the fullness of God. He says you're on the, ooh, oh, glory, thank you, Lord. He says you're on the verge of something big. <laughs> Come on, say it with me. I'm on the verge of something big. Ooh, that just sounds good. My insides got tickled. Go oh, glory to God. Now, this is something I went before the Lord. When I was putting some things down, I said, Lord, you know, I had some things happen in my past. And, and you know, I'm not as far along as some of my friends. I, I'm not as far as long in, in church and I'm not far as long as I should be in ministry. I, I'm, not, I'm not where I, I want to be. I, I haven't shown up there. It's, it's not all that, Lord, that I, I thought it would be at this time. And while I'm preparing this, the Lord said, don't be fooled by what you see. <laughs> Come on, don't be fooled by what you see. He says, I'm ready to take your past that's been littered with all kinds of dumb messes and I'll turn the whole thing around suddenly. Yes. Yes. People will come to you for advice. Folks that you thought didn't even want to give you the time of day. Some of your relatives will find that you've returned a great relationship with your kids that ran from your standing with the Lord, they will come back. Because they were raised in the things of God, they will come back. They will come back with a vengeance. And the devil is shuddering to think they're going to show up. That's why he's hitting so hard. They're going to show up and serve and be glad. Ooh, glory. And be glad. Don't be fooled by what you see. God has a plan that he hasn't even shown you. You can't even imagine what he's got in store for you. God has joy for your life. God has planned victory for your life. God has planned deliverance for your life. God has planned money for your life to be able to give to the gospel. More than you can even imagine. Some of you say, I can imagine pretty good. You can't even imagine what he's got in mind. You can't imagine. You can't imagine. Come on, say it with me. Don't be fooled, Don't be fooled. by what you see. Oh, glory. Ooh, glory. <laughs> That's a plan of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that we have heard this, your word to us today. We're on the verge of something big. We're on the verge of something big and will not be moved by what we see. We thank you, Lord, for hearing us and waiting for us, even when we were going the other way. But, Lord, we're willing to do what you called us to do. Let this time be a great, great anointed time for our future. Our latter will be greater than our former. And we trust you even now for a multiple of blessing that will come upon us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now listen to me as we pray this morning. Somebody here been dealing, this is a word, you've been dealing with vertigo. You catch yourself getting dizzy, weird times, dizzy. Catch yourself, you're, you're moving a certain way on the bed and all of a sudden the spinning of the room. You're like, what, what, what? Come on, just raise your hand. We're going to pray. If you've been dealing with vertigo in any way, I come against that in the name of Jesus and I command that to stop its actions in your life and you'll not have dizziness anymore. Completely exited from your body in Jesus' name. In the same manner, the Lord said, there's somebody been dealing with ringing in your ears. Come on, 
Raise your hand. We're going to pray. Thank you, Father, for that to stop now. Ringing in the ears where it sounds like some alarms going off all the time. I take authority over it in the name of Jesus and I say by the word of the Lord, stop it. Leave them alone. Stop your action against them. You have no right to stand against them. They have a covenant with God. And I command you to stop your work on their body in Jesus' name. Now I'm praying for people that have dealt with a backache or dealt with a neck ache. Come on, raise your hand. Anyone with a back, you know your back's not been right. You know your neck's been catching you off guard. You even have trouble when you're sleeping. I command those things to stop hurting in the name of Jesus. By his stripes you are healed. No weapon formed against you will prosper in the name of Jesus. By the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, you receive the healing of God. It's yours. You are the healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm praying now for somebody. Oh, the Lord said it like this. Sensitive teeth. Come on, raise your hand. Sensitive teeth. You've got sensitive teeth. They're sensitive to hot. They're sensitive to cold. You've even found your tongue uncomfortable at times. It's like, man, my tongue is getting uncomfortable. In the name of Jesus, I command your teeth to be whole and well. All your teeth to be right in the same manner. I command your hair follicles to be strong. And all your hair to grow properly. To be in rows the way it's supposed to be. To be in the right place in the name of Jesus. That your hair grow properly. Those dealing with fatigue, we come against it in the name of Jesus. You've been fatigued. You've been tired. You catch yourself tired. I say to you, be healed. Be healed. Be whole. Be well. Strong. Healthy in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Those that have dealt with red eye. You caught yourself. Your eyes, they got, they got lines on them. It's like the little redness of the eye. I command those things to be healed in the name of Jesus. I command them to be healed in Jesus' name. I command them to be healed. The last thing the Lord gave me here, he said, you pray for ab abdomens, anything in stomach. He said, all around the stomach, all around in the intestines, all healed in Jesus' name. He said, if you would receive this, the healing is yours now, and you will not deal with any more stomach problems and heartburn in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we break the power over your body in Jesus' name. You can do it. It is the plan of God. Amen. Healing is yours in Jesus' name. Healing is yours in Jesus' name. Oh, praise God.